So here we have is the next section, section 6.2. Here's some of our objectives. We're looking at identifying some of the changes brought in the early years of the Jefferson presidency. So as we can see, Jefferson ends up becoming the third president of the United States. The second thing is we're looking at the declining power of the Federalists. Remember, John Adams, he was a Federalist, okay? He believed in strong national government. The last thing is we have the Louisiana Purchase. This is a sort of a huge event that happens in the U.S., so we'll talk a little bit about that. So first of all, we have a bitter campaign between Adams and Jefferson in the third um, election in the United States. What ends up happening is we have Adams and Jefferson, they're basically hurling insults at each other. It sort of marks sort of a very negative um, campaign in American history. What ends up happening is that Jefferson beats Adams by only eight electoral votes. So while Jefferson beats Adams, it does represent a sort of problem in the voting system because Jefferson ties with Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr gets the same amount of votes as Jefferson. They both beat Adams. So now what the, uh, they have to end up doing is the House of Representatives they are trying to cast more votes within themselves without breaking a tie. What ends up happening is it's sort of a struggle to decide who should become the next president, Aaron Burr or Jefferson. Hamilton, now remember Hamilton is a Federalist and, does, and is always sort of fighting with Jefferson. He sort of intervenes. And what he ends up saying, or he sort of comes into the House of Representatives and speaks on behalf of what is happening. So what he does is that he says that because Jefferson has more experience than Aaron Burr, that Jefferson should be awarded two extra victory points. The House of Representatives take into consideration Hamilton's um, what Hamilton says, and they actually do what he is suggesting. But this whole process, this whole electoral process, also reveals that there are still problems in, um, in the Constitution and the government. So this leads to them making the Twelfth Amendment pass. And the Twelfth Amendment looks at electors cast separate ballots for president and vice president. Okay. Because if you remember, Jefferson and Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr was supposed to be Jefferson's vice president, but because he got the same amount of votes as Jefferson, that is why they ha struggled to try and decide who became the president, okay? So here's sort of an idea of the electoral deadlock. Jefferson presidency. What ends up happening during Jefferson's presidency is we have an ongoing growth of the Democratic Republicans, which is the party that Jefferson is a part of, and sort of the demise or the fall of the Federalist Party, which is what who John Adams is a part of. Okay? What Jefferson starts off doing in his presidency is first he reduces the size of the armed forces. He also cuts social expenses from the government. So what he's, Jefferson actually believed in living a very simple life. He did not want to have many fancy things. So one of the things he does to cut social expenses is he walks to work. He doesn't use any sort of um, horse and buggy or anything fancy to get to work. He also is known for dressing casual in, um, in meetings. He's saying, I'm not going to buy fancy clothes. I'm going to sort of reduce my spending so that I can help the government. He also eliminates internal taxes. So what that means is, remember, we have this National Bank of the United States that goes into the Constitution. Jefferson never liked this National Bank. So what he does is, is he tries to reduce the influence of the National Bank of the US. The last thing is he starts free, free trade throughout government. So he promotes the idea of free trade rather than promoting government-controlled trade. So if the national government was stronger, that means that they would also control 
trade and tax trades, that's tariffs. Jefferson loosens this up. He's saying free trade is good for our economy. Let's make sure that we're making our citizens happy with, the, with free trade. Southern dominance. This also sort of marks a point where southern states have more of a say in office. The first thing is that um, the capital of the United States is no longer in New York City. It moves to Washington, D.C. This is, Jefferson is the first president to actually take office in Washington, D.C. What ends up happening is for the next few presidencies, we only have southern elected people becoming the president. As we can see in the um, earlier, the northern, they were the federalists. The Southern, they were the Democratic Republicans, okay? So the Federalists, they end up losing a lot of their power in government, while the Southern Democratic Republicans, they gain more power. So New England, the Federalist involvement in national politics decline. Federalists did not want to appeal to common masses. If we remember, Federalists, they were often the more rich and high-end people. They want things to sort of stay the same. They don't want things to change. Whereas um, the Democratic Republicans, they're wanting expansion. They want free trade. They want to make sure that farmers and merchants are happy in their government. The last thing is that we have Western expansion. So settlers tend to be farmers. The more people who expand westward, these are farmers and they are going to be Democratic, Republican. They are not going to be Federalist. They are not rich. Next we have is we have sort of um, a big controversy in the government and it involves the Supreme Court, the judiciary um, branch of the government. Now under John Adams, the Federalist John Marshall, he was the Chief Justice. So John Adams appointed him as the head of the Supreme Court. Now Adams, he pushes this Judiciary Act of, of 1801, and what he wants to do is he wants to add 16 federal judges. Now why John Adams wants to do this is he realizes that they, he wants the Federalists to get more power in the government. And the way that he does this is by adding judges in the Supreme Court. So first he adds 16 judges, and then he appoints 16 Federalist judges the day before he is no longer the president. So if you can imagine, Adams puts in this act, Judiciary Act of 1801, then the night before he sort of steps out of his president role, he elects 16 judges that would be on his side and would have his opin uh, opinion in the Supreme Court. They are called the Midnight Judges. Jefferson, he gets a little angry because now the President, Jefferson, takes over and he, his whole Supreme Court is filled with Federalist judges. Federalist judges who would not really allow Jefferson to pass through many things. Jefferson argues that all these papers that are pushed through the last night of Adam's presidency, that they are not actually valid papers. This ends up to one of the first uh, Supreme Court cases called Marbury, Marbury versus Madison. What happens with Marbury versus Madison is we have William Marbury, who is a Federalist. He is suing the government. He was supposed to be one of these midnight judges, but his paperwork, which was sent to the Supreme Court and to the, president, the executive branch of the government, they end up getting lost. Marbury believed that it was Jefferson and Jefferson's men who lost his paperwork, basically saying that he is not going to be a judge in the Supreme Court. Marshall rules that this is unconstitutional. It is against his rights and that um, the people should actually allow him to be a, a Supreme Court judge. 
What ends up happening is we have the power of the judicial review. In the Supreme Court, they're able to declare laws unconstitutional. So what ends up, what happens is that we actually see um, Mar Marlborough, he actually ends up becoming a Supreme Court judge. And this shows the power of the checks and balances system and judicial review. The Supreme Court, they are allowed to um, determine whether something is unconstitutional. And if we remember, John Adams appointed many Federalist judges. So of course that they're, they're going to decide on Marlborough's end. The last thing we're going to focus on is we have the U.S. again is expanding Western. So some things is we see um, areas like Ohio, the population is growing from 45,000 to 231,000. We also have um, more people settling in places like Kentucky and Tennessee. We also see in 1775, we have a man, Daniel Boone, he actually can reach, he clears a road that allows it easier for settlers to move west. This leads to one of the most important things that happens during um, Jefferson's presidency. It's called the Louisiana Purchase. So Louisiana, it was originally returned to France. And what Jefferson, he ends up fearing that the French are going to start having a stronger and stronger presence. So Jefferson decides that he needs to buy Louisiana from France. So, or, or they may go to war. So Jefferson ends up meeting with Napoleon. Yes, Napoleon is in charge of France at this time. Napoleon basically has lost some of his favor in France. He doesn't really have the time to expand in the US. So Napoleon actually agrees to, um, agrees to the Louisiana Purchase. They end up selling Florida and many of um, the Western land to the United States. This purchase doubles the size of the U.S. So if we see the blue, this is what the U.S. is so far. We had the 13 colonies on the East Coast. We already have the expanding Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana territory. Okay, So these are newly settled areas. Well, after um, the Louisiana Purchase, all of a sudden the U.S. owns all this land out west. Okay. And it's supposed to promote all these people living over here to start moving there and starting new farms and agriculture. So this is how um, the U.S. starts to grow. Now, as you can see, we still have a lot of Spanish territory over here. We're going to get to how we expand there later. Lastly, Jefferson is sort of excited about all this new land. So he appoints these two men, Lewis and Clark. And they are sort of the first men to start leading themselves through these western lands that they just bought. They are gathering all sorts of information about what kind of people live there, the plants that they have, and many of the animals. Now it's important to note that Lewis and Clark, they needed help, and they actually got help from a Native American woman. Her name is Sacagawea. Sorry to mess up that name. She actually serves as an interpreter to these two Americans as they go through the West. So if you can imagine, this route is actually Lewis and Clark's route. So they start from the Indiana Territory and they make their way all through here, all the way to the Pacific. Of course, with the help of Sacagawea, uh, sorry, 